My name is Dan Gisselquist. I was going to reveal the secret just a moment ago. Um, anybody uh, visited the Zip CPU blog, had a look at what's on there? Let me invite you to come and visit the Zip CPU blog. A lot of this stuff is posted on the Zip CPU blog. Uh, my Twitter handle is interesting as well, uh, available there as well. Uh, there is a beginner's tutorial, and I am currently entertaining the idea of putting together an intermediate tutorial, something to go from, uh, I like to say Blinky to Axie, but I'm not really sure if I want to go all the way to Axie, possibly just stop at Wishbone. Uh, so uh, feel free to check that out on the, on the blog. Let's see, hey, Axie. Does everybody know what, a I'm going to call it Axie, not AXI. Does everybody know what Axie is? Oh boy, I, I can skip a lot of this. It's everywhere. If you want to use a vendor CPU, Axie. Uh, if you want to incorporate your stuff into a major vendor's, you know, buy a interconnect, Axie. It's everywhere. You really have to use it. What makes it special? Well, it's the high speed bus part of the ARM protocol. It's cache aware, it's capable, it can be very fast. Uh, you need to speak it to work with microprocessors, Microblaze, NIOS, Zinc. Um, it, <laughs> it, it's a real pain to get right. If you drop one response, your design will hang until the next reset. I've been there, okay? Uh, you don't want to be, and oh, by the way, the, I do all my debugging with a, um, a bus-based scope, so if the bus hangs, I don't get any debug information. So getting Axie right is very important to me. And like I say there, it's harder to do well. There's also Axie Lite, very simplified version of Axie. Doesn't support burst transactions. All the responses must be in order. Wait, Axie supports out of order? Yeah. Um, it doesn't give you exclusive bus access. But how complex is it? Well, as I'm going to say, show you today, neither Intel nor Xilinx got their demonstration examples right. Unfortunately, the Intel examples are in the backup, so when we get to that, we'll talk about that a little bit more. What's formal verification? You guys have heard about formal verification a couple times. Let me talk about three different modes. It's an exhaustive search across all inputs. Three different modes you need to know about are number one, there's a bounded model check mode. This is similar to black box testing. The problem is formal verification is a um, search over everything. The combinatorial explosion is going to get you here. The second possibility is induction. If you can do an induction check, this starts in the middle of the design, uh, you know, somewhere, sometime after the beginning of time, and it could be anywhere from there until the hardware stops working. And uh, your success is when it can't find a fault at all in your program. This is very white box. This is something a lot of people struggle with when dealing with formal verification. You've got to get assertions into your code to make sure that it never gets out of bounds. And they're, they're somewhat intrusive. So if you get used to formal verification, you'll get used to this. On the other hand, it's nice to know that your design will never have a bug, not even 517 clocks into the program. Cover, just trying to find a, a single trace, some trace, any trace that matches the user goal. You can specify all kinds of goals for that. So here's the overview of my talk now that we've gone through that background. What I want to talk about is some basic properties of Axie Lite. And then I'm going to show you some examples of the bugs you can find with those basic properties. And then I'll show you some traces from some of the demonstration designs I have, open source designs posted on GitHub. In the backups, the whole slides will be posted on GitHub as well. I've got how long does a proof take regarding Axie, some properties of Axie full, more examples and traces. This is where I've hidden the Intel traces. Some customer experiences, really fun stories that you get from uh, what Xilinx hasn't yet deleted. Uh, but yes, they do delete things on their forum, which is how these bugs have probably gone unnoticed for some time. So formal properties, let's go through four, four of them. The first one's pretty obvious. Reset clears everything. All transactions in process wiped clean on a reset. You can't be in the middle of a transaction. You can't be waiting on a transaction. You got to start from a blank slate following a reset. Property number two, if a channel is stalled, and here you have an example where there's a valid and not ready, that's a stall condition. If the channel is ever stalled, nothing's allowed to change until you have both valid and ready. 
unfortunately, TileLink doesn't do this. I'm a little disappointed, but I find a whole lot of bugs have missed uh, dropped packets right here with the, just this property. There you go. There's a stall. The data associated with the channel has to stay constant. The valid has to stay high. Here's um, how that's expressed. I think the picture probably does it better justice, so I'm going to go on. Uh, next rule, you can't respond to something if you haven't had a request. I, I, this is sort of basic, right? We, we've done counters. Well, let's just do a counter. Let's count up all the requests, and every time you see a response, the counter goes back down. You're not allowed to have a response if there's not an outstanding request. Number four, keeping this really simple, every request should get one, and only one, response. Basic properties, you think everybody would follow these properties. Um, I'm going to add a couple others. All the properties, by the way, all of these Axie Lake properties, these are all posted um, on my uh, Wishbone to Axie um, site. You'll get a link to that later. The problem is you put the properties together, you got to test them. There's no way to know if you've got a good set of properties if you don't dig into uh, some cores that work, hopefully, and find out does it meet the spec or doesn't it meet the spec. So I took a look at a bunch of cores from Xilinx. Xilinx gives you some demonstration cores to start your designs from. Uh, Intel's not up there. I did look at theirs. I also looked at Xilinx's GPIO core. That has a nice Axiolite interface. We're going to look at a couple cores from uh, GitHub and some of my own cores and look at some traces from them. Remember, full, veri full formal verification. I didn't do it for this core, but the full verification for all eternity it takes a little bit of time to do. It takes me about an hour to two hours to set up for the stuff that looks like Axie's demonstration cores. After that, it usually takes about eh, less than two minutes to actually run the tools and find all the bugs. So here's a... Uh, if you go to Vivado, you say, I want to build an Axie-like design. Uh, as of 2016, when I copied their design, here's a, something you could give to it. If you give it two read requests and just a little bit of back pressure, well, guess what happens? It'll respond to the first read request and not the second one. Your design just hung. This is their example, by the way, that, you know, if they want, you, they want you to learn how to use Axie, they want you to learn how to use their stuff, and they're going to leave you with a broken example. Xilinx's tech support, by the way, said, oh, that's not a bug. Well, why not? Well, you don't know that the answer's not coming back later. Okay, there's not enough flip-flops to store another answer inside this design. That's a bug. It's not coming back later. Here's the same core. This side's the right side. Two rights. One response, this design's going to hang too. I checked this against 2019.1. They fixed one of these. So th these bugs have been outstanding for years. Here's another one. Uh, anyone familiar with the tiny TPU here? Okay, I found this one online. Fun little core to look at. Um, here you have, they had a state machine to handle one transaction into the core at a time, either read or write. The problem the state machine had is if you ever asked for a read and a write at the same time, the state machine remained in idle. Your Axie bus will just hang. Whatever master is asking for something is going to be asking for the rest of eternity or until you hit that reset switch. Here's another example from a Wishbone Axie project. Um, in this case, the user checked for uh, two types of responses. He checked for whether you had a, um, let's see, an OK response or a slave error response. Uh, this, is a, this is a wishbone, so we start with a wishbone request. We then get to an Axie request, an Axie response. But if it was a decode error response, he never returned anything back to the wishbone bus. And so here you have again, now this time the wishbone box is going to hang waiting for a response that will never come. The neat thing about wishbone is you can at least do a bus abort and start over. Um, here's an example from a major vendor. Um, shall we say hello to the major vendor here? Western Digital, hello. Um, this one's actually on me. It's not on them. You'll see. But in this case, if you ever had uh, two loads in a row, two stores in a row, one on each of the two instruction streams, you might get uh, something dropped along the way. 
And so I was pretty excited about this. I found over six protocol violations. I was, hey, I'm doing really good. This is a nice major vendor core. Uh, most revolved around adjacent loads and stores. They dropped a request. Their own assertions passed to a simulation, failed formal. Hey, this is why formal is so useful. I'm, I'm feeling really good about myself. So we then sent a request to, to them, you know, take a look at our traces. They said, hey, we noticed you let the scan mode input signal just sort of toggle throughout your trace. Can you try running that again with a scan mode held low? Yeah, sure, no problem. <sighs> just when you were feeling so good about what you've discovered, right? Now, one of the things it does illustrate is it illustrates one of the powers of formal. It will toggle everything. Even the inputs you're not necessarily expecting it to toggle just to find a bug. Um, I'm not willing to say this core has any bugs in it anymore. There is one assertion. It's an internal assertion error. I have no idea what it means. I haven't resolved that one. Uh, we'll see if their uh, team gets back to me on that one. Okay, let's take a look at uh, some cover traces. So you can use cover to ask the question of how fast does this core work. So here we come back to uh, Xilinx's Axilite demo. And you can see the fastest this core can work, at best, one transaction every two clocks. That's a 50% throughput. That's really not high speed. Axie is a high speed bus. This is not high speed. Uh, here's an example from their GPIO core. Has anyone ever tried using their GPIO core just to see how fast you can toggle Blinky? Um, it, it takes six clocks just to go through their core. Uh, that, that's as fast as their core will work. Um, a lot of people complained about how fast Blinky works when using ARM or Microblaze going through this core. Uh, there's a read. Still takes another six clocks just to go through their core. You can do a lot better than that, so let me, hey, uh, let me share. I've got uh, some links in here to an Axielite demonstration core, a full Axie demonstration design, an Axielite to Axie bridge, an Axie to Axielite bridge. Um, I'll, show you, uh, I'll show you a nice trace from that one. Real cool. I've got some crossbars posted, a stream to memory map, and a memory map to stream core posted. Uh, unlike Xilinxes, those last two will actually get you 100% bus uh, throughput utilization, no idle cycles. I still haven't done the full Axie DMA. That's kind of dreamware now. I think I'm ready to do it. I just haven't done it. So here we go. The open source Axie demo that I have, you'll notice it gets 100% um, throughput. Every clock is used. Um, and that was just generated from a formal cover statement. Uh, if you want speed, Axie Light. Okay, I like Wishbone. I'll be honest, Wishbone Pipeline, it's my favorite. But you can just about do the same thing with Axie Light. It's just about as good enough. Um, it doesn't cost you anything to bridge from Axie Light to Axie. You can push high speed through Axie Light. The problem is a lot of your vendor cores are going to limit. It's like they throttle how fast you can do. Uh, you, you're not allowed to go that fast. Uh, it's a shame. You should be able to do much faster than that, some of these things. But here's an example of how powerful Axie Light is. So here we have an Axie demonstration design. Axie demonstration. This is the formal tool generated. It, it, it's a bridge we're talking about. It costs you one clock to go from Axie to Axie Light to get a response and come back again. Um, so you're, you're, stuff, you're stuck with four clocks lost there, but this is how it should work. Look at that. Four bursts, no beats lost in the transactions. You don't have to issue one at a time and wait for the response. You can just stuff that pipeline as fast as you want to. Uh, that core, by the way, is on uh, GitHub. So why did I find so many of these cores that were broken? And I've got a lot more traces showing broken stuff in the backups. Uh, Simulation is dependent on the creativity of the tester. If you don't test multiple Axie light or Axie requests right after another, after another, after another, or if you don't test the, um, the, the back pressure, put a lot of back pressure into it, or if you don't anticipate that reads and writes are ever going to have a request at the same time, hey, this is Axie, this is sort of the point, you're not going to get this. Now, I had one person, he wrote me a, an email, and he said, 
I like your core. I want to try your core in simulation. I, w I just want to know that it works. Can, do you have a simulation design? You know, something where I can say, read XYZ or write XYZ. I almost pulled my hair out because the moment you get to a simulation command that just does a read or just does a write and encapsulates everything, you miss all of the bugs that I just showed you here. If your simulation doesn't capture all of that, you're going to miss this stuff. Yeah, formal methods catches a whole lot of things you're not expecting there. Um, vendor VIP, uh, Axie's VIP, or Xilinx's VIP, I saw somebody writes into their uh, forums, he says, my, my core is broken, what's wrong with my core? And I went and I formally verified his core, it looked very much like their demonstration design. I said, here's all the bugs in your core. And um, he said, well, it passed the Xilinx's VIP. Yeah, that tells you a little bit about their VIP. Um, their training examples have bugs. I've just shown you a lot of those. So I'm going to conclude with this conversation. This started on Reddit. It was a forum post. Somebody posts on Reddit. He says, I've got this wonderful design, but you know something's wrong with the interconnect. Does anybody have any experience with the interconnect? I'm, I'm certain Xilinx's interconnect has a bug in it or something. I, I, I can't figure out what's going wrong. A whole bunch of people responded, all kinds of different answers. I'm the lone guy sitting there going, have you formally verified your design? Nobody, ref you know, nobody answered my question. He didn't say whether he'd, he just ignored it completely. He then turned around, he goes to Xilinx's forums. He says, your interconnect is broken. Uh, no longer a question. This, this is a statement. Your interconnect is broken. Uh, have you formally verified your design? Ignores me again. Puts out a trace. He says, here's the trace. This proves your interconnect is broken. Uh, let's look at your trace here. You see one request and two responses. I think that's your core that's broken. If you had formally verified your core, you would not have had that problem. I have no idea how I've done on time so far. That's my uh, conclusion slide. Uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, if you don't have questions, I'll be glad to show you a whole lot more uh, traces or other things from the backups if you're interested. Hey, thanks. So I think we have seen a lot of bugs, and every piece of IP has bugs, and uh, mine probably has more than anybody else's. Um, so how can we transform this into something positive, into bug reports, for one thing, and making sure that those bugs don't reappear again? So adding more formal or things you have been doing to existing open source IP. So you have been using some open source IP. Are you kind of going to add the the verification that you did, do that as a pull request to the original project so they can improve on top of that? Um, usually, so for every bug I've presented here, I've issued an, or I've submitted an issue. Uh, you're welcome to ask for any IP. I don't normally edit other people's code. Uh, maybe I should, but I've got that available. Uh, you're welcome to it. Uh, that said, I'm thinking of one person who asked for it and I haven't given it to him, so I, I try. I'm, I'm not quite as good at that. I think um, yet to, to add to that, I think bug reports are one thing. They help you to fix a thing once, but actually adding the methodology or adding the formal properties to the core so makes it sure that it doesn't reappear. So I can't go backwards on that really easily. So the examples I have include the formal properties, or at least the Axialite examples. Um, they're not that hard to put in. Just sort of copy them into your code in a formal section. If you that gets you to the first, I don't know, 5, 10, 20, 40 clocks. If you want to prove for all time, you have to actually tie your code to the formal properties, put the two together. I've got examples showing how to do that as well. Um, I don't have a question, Dan. I uh, thought I'd have give you some feedback. Um, I just actually put onto my Facebook page uh, your page uh, because I have a former colleague who uh, is actually doing stuff with Axie on Silinx. Um said, Danji has found some issues with Xilinx Intel implementations, has a very few to go look at the page. And his response very quickly came back, I know both implementations are terribly resource hungry, so I don't use them. Nice to see someone is inspecting them. Yeah, you know, the sad thing about resources is when you um, cleaned up their design, and so like my demo designs are, you know, redo I shouldn't say they're cleaned up, they're redone from scratch. I think they use fewer resources than their demo design does and work twice as fast. Kind of disappointing. Papang. 
Yeah, so now you're on stage instead of in the audience asking questions, I'll ask some questions. <laughs> um, first, uh, is, 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 is like you, you do find these properties for XI. Is that some library that people can just take and apply to their own XI stuff? Uh, the uh, AXI light is very much that, yes. Uh, the AXI properties haven't been fully released. Uh, they have properties released for Wishbone, Wishbone Classic. Um, I have properties under development for AHB, APB. I fully expect to release those. I'm a little embarrassed by my Tylink properties right now, so I'll probably do a little bit more work with those uh, if somebody has interest before releasing those. But yeah, I've got a bunch of that stuff well yeah. available. The other question is more about XI itself, because I'm kind of don't really expert in that. Uh, so you, you, you said you have an XI to XI light bridge and other way around. Mm -hmm. Is that because there's sort of like uh, a master-slave relationship? Or why, why is it the bridge from one to the other different from the bridge to the other to the one? Uh, because AXI is um, a sort of like a superset of Axi light. It allows out-of-order cores. It allows bursting. Um, you can make multiple burst requests. Uh, you have to indicate with your acknowledgement the end of the burst as opposed to AXI light is only a uh, single beat transactions at a time. Uh, AXI also has cache coherence protocol associated with it. I haven't looked into that. It also has a protocol for uh, locking the bus and doing um, atomic access. Again, that's something I haven't looked into. Uh, the biggest problem I have in transferring from AXI to AXI Lite is having to deal with the bursts and the IDs, which aren't present in AXI Lite, which have to be then reconstructed by the bridge. The other way around is real easy. Even though Xilinx's code, when you go from Axi Lite to Axi, uh, they've got code to restrict it to only a one read burst at a time or one write burst at a time, never both, and never sequential multiple bursts in the pipe. I, I, I don't know why they restrict it in their, their bridge. But there's an option that restricts it for some strange reason that I don't understand. So do you use ARM's uh, entire suite of properties? Because officially, you can, write, you can get the handbook on Axie, the you know, 1,000 or 2,000 pages, whatever it is. But they, they say they also provide properties. I have not SDA. seen ARM's properties. I have not seen their, um, okay. their demo cores. These are all done based on a lot of Axi or Xilinx's stuff and uh, also on Intel's stuff. Yeah, and another thing is that you said that in white box testing, you know, all the properties end up inside of your RTL, but I thought in system bear logs, you add all your assertions somewhere else oh, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, get yeah, access yeah. to all yeah, the, yeah, 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 the traces. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. um, it doesn't have to be inside the RTL, but it has to be touching your, it has to touch the values within the RTL. So in System Verilog, when you use the bind command, that's what you're doing is you're saying this value, you know, you're allowing your assertions to say this value here and that value there are related by this way. All right, thank you very much. Or, well, oh, hey, we got another one. <laughs> just a quick last one. Uh, just a quick one. Is Probably less of a question than anything, more, more of a learning experience. I remember meeting you several years ago, probably here at Allconf, actually, for the first time. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm not going to do all this stuff. This is really complicated. It's just going to make my life really, really difficult. Pretty soon, uh, I soon realized that I had to use things like co-simulation, for example, uh, improve my life tremendously. I still haven't taken the step to do the formal stuff, but I'm sure I'm going to get to the stage and, you know, follow some of your recommendations and actually use that and uh, it's probably going to improve my life considerably <laughs> as well once I take the steps. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, so if you've never done formal verification before, I have a tutorial on my site for, uh, it sort of starts with beginners. I've also got a set of slides. I'll be willing to teach them to you professionally or you're welcome to just go through them on your own and uh, learn some formal verification and uh, be all the better for it. Let's take them again. 